Okay, so I think we'll make a start. Um, we're delighted to welcome you all this evening to um, our lecture with Dr. Charlie Barnes. Thanks ever so much for joining us. And we're thrilled to welcome Charlie for her second lecture with us, The Truth About True Crime, How Honest is Our Favourite John? The lecture is part of a programme of humanities lectures that we're hosting at the centre this month. Um, and these are partly online and partly face to face in the centre. My name is Paula Harrison and I'm the coordinator of University Centre Telford and we're part of the University of Wolverhampton and are currently based in the heart of Telford in Shropshire. So just before I introduce Charlie, um, there's just a couple of housekeeping things to go through. Uh, there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the lecture via the Q&A button. And just to say that if you're using a laptop or a desktop, the icon is on the bottom of your screen in the middle. And if you're using a mobile, it will be in the top right hand corner. And just to remind you that Zoom is a public platform and the lecture is being recorded. So please don't share any personal information. So just to tell you a little bit about Charlie, um, Charlie is an author, poet and academic based in Worcestershire. She was the Worcestershire Poet Laureate for 2019-2020, but she's well, also well known for her fiction, publishing crime fiction novels as Charlotte, Charlotte Barnes and poetry as Charlie. She's a lecturer at the University of Wolverhampton in the Creative and Professional Writing Department, although she has also lectured at various universities around the West Midlands, including Newman and the University of Worcester. Charlie specialises in gendered roles in contemporary crime fiction, often exploring this through the practice-based research of her own writing. So Charlie has published lots of novels and her most recent novel is out next week. Um, it's called A Safe Word. It's a thriller with a splash of the erotic that revolves around sex games, murder, and the secrets of suburbia. So I hope that really grabs you, that combination. And it's available now as a 99p pre-order on Kindle. Um, and if anybody is interested, and I, I can put the link in the, um, in the chat. Um, so as I say, there will be the opportunity for Q&A at the end of the lecture. Um, and I hand over now to Charlie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paula. Um, I always get a touch nervous after people have read a bio out about me because I feel like it, set, it sets too high a bar. Um, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully the lecture will um, live up to standards. Um, so just kind of a, a, a how it looks from here then, I'm going to pull up some slides um, if there are any problems um, in terms of viewing those. I'm, I'm sure that you can pop a message in chat and um, someone will flag me down and, and stop me from going any further. And um, so please feel free to do that. Um, I will be off camera while I'm presenting, but very much, very much still here um, as an omniscient narrator in the background. Um, so I will pull up the beginning of this presentation. There we go. Um, so in terms of how the how the lecture looks from here on in, um, we're going to think a little bit about the, the origins of true crime and kind of what the, the genesis of that genre was. Um, and we'll also look at some seminal works within the genre that are much more much more contemporary in terms of their dates and the ethical bars that have been established um, by these works, although I kind of use ethical in a very loose sense as you'll come to see over the course of the lecture. Um, we'll also think a little bit about fragmentation of the genre into different media formats, um, which is something that I'll explore um, across things like uh, podcasts and makeup tutorials, more on that shortly. Um, and we'll also think a little bit about where that leaves the truth now, um, kind of in a broad theoretical sense, but also in relation to true crime as a fiction or non-fiction genre, whatever it may be. Um, so it's kind of a, a common misnomer then that true crime has its origins solely in the 1900s. Um, lots of people kind of get drawn into this 
misconception, preconception, largely because of Jack the Ripper and, and kind of the associated media fallout of that. Um, but there's actually some, albeit questionable research, um, but interesting research nevertheless, um, that shows the genre might actually have some kind of socio-cultural roots as far back as Shakespeare. And, and I root it in Shakespeare specifically because there are some who now believe that Shakespeare may have actually co-authored sort of the first true crime drama as it, as it was. Um, and this was a, a production called Arden of Feversham, although there are some variations on what the spelling of that, um, on what the spelling of that is. Um, and that dates to the, the late 1500s. Um, and that particular story um, tells a narrative of Thomas Arden, who was murdered by his wife and her lover. Um, and the play sort of retells that murder plot the eventual discovery of that murder having taken place and then the, the subsequent punishment that came out as a result of it. Um, and it is sort of particularly noteworthy whether, whether we consider it as true crime or whether we just consider it as a drama production. It's particularly noteworthy because it's sort of the, the first real example that we have of drama discussing a very recent event. Um, and at that time in particular, drama productions tended to be um, much more rooted in sort of far off historicism um, rather than things that had only very recently happened, um, which sort of adds weight to this idea of it being the first true crime drama or true crime production. Um, Shakespeare's involvement, again, we can kind of leave, leave as a slight question mark perhaps. Um, so if we skip ahead. Um, so I'm going to sample a lot here um, from various texts that kind of support the discussion in one way or another. There is a reference slide at the end, um, but this uh, particular extract and the extracts that will follow um, is actually taken from um, a much wider discussion um, by an academic around sort of British murder and the genesis of British murder as part of media culture um, and one of the one of the best quotes that I could pull from this the easiest and cheapest way to find out about murder was on the broad side um, Now this is obviously going back some hundred years or so this very simple kind of newspaper often just one piece of paper was printed on one side only it lay just within the financial reach of even the working man or woman um, so significantly then, as reportage then progressed on from this, so did the ways in which um, violent crimes specifically were reported on. Um, and I've already mentioned Jack the Ripper as kind of a theorised genesis of this, um, but the public's preoccupation with true crime as, as part of media production and media reproductions actually predates Ripper's reign, or the Ripper's reign rather considerably. Um, so in the years prior to the Ripper's attacks, there was an influx of true crime being documented across different broadsides. And there was also quite a common trend of reporting um, hangings and public executions as well. And these were kind of written about and, and indeed consumed in a similar way to how true crime would have been reported. And many members of the public sort of marked this as like a very important date in the calendar when, when these hangings were likely to be taken place. Um, and there were actually some uh, quite famous and quite unsavoury reports of more elite members of the public hiring out expensive rooms so they could gain a better view of a hanging platform. Um, and not only would they hire those rooms out, but they would also have kind of kind of a sort of party along with it where their equally elite friends would, would go along and sort of share in the festivity as it were. So they were able to watch the hanging take place as a, as a group, as a collective. Um, and a, an additional thing kind of worth noting sort of from a similar era, era to this then um, is a publication reported as the, the Newgate calendar, um, which also sort of gave, gave people something that they could really get their teeth into, which was a very crass way of phrasing it. 
Um, but but this sort of capitalised very much on the public's opinion um, or the public's uh, preoccupation rather with with the common criminal as it as it were at the time. Um, so the Newgate calendar started out as a list of criminals who had been executed at Newgate, but once popularity kind of picked up, eventually later editions were padded out with much more contextual information about sort of the life of these criminals or the lives of these criminals, as well as the crimes that they committed. And again, as um, popularity picked up further, not only were the, were the contextual details sort of reported on as part of the Newgate calendar, they were also kind of embellished and very much glamorized to, to kind of give us this, this early exemplar of what, of what true crime could be or, or, or would come to be rather. Um, and adding in these details very much made them more attractive to readers, um, which is, of course, why they continue to do it. And given that the Newgate authorities knew these criminals better than anyone else could attest to, um, both in terms of their crimes that, that had kind of landed them in Newgate in the first instance, but also what their lives had been like around that, the, the, the people behind this um, publication inevitably became kind of a real authority on it and and who could possibly question them given that they had all of the information so close to hand. Um, building on that further then, um, another text that is very much worth considering um, and I highly recommend it, um, it's, it's actually out of copyright now so you can find copies of this quite easily online. Um, I know that uh, Project Gutenberg, I'm always very mindful of mispronouncing that. Um, I know that uh, that particular database, she says, avoiding saying the name for a second time, um, definitely has a copy of it. Um, so on murder considered as one of the fine arts by Thomas de Quincey, um, as, as part of that, or one of the quotes that I've pulled from that, people begin to see that something more goes to the composition of a fine murder than two blockheads to kill and be killed, a knife, a purse and a dark lane, design, gentlemen, grouping, light and shade, poetry, sentiment are now deemed indispensable to attempts of this nature. Now some wider context around On Murder considered as one of the fine arts then, so it is um, very much a satirical essay, um, although there have been public and interesting misreadings of it is quite a serious publication instead. Um, but De Quincey put this together as a means of critiquing the public's preoccup preoccupation with violent crime and specifically the public preoccupation with murder. Um, and in, in this um, essay, he kind of stages a murder club or a murder appreciation club, wherein members would openly critique violent crimes as they take play, place in real life or like or rather the real life setting of the essay or the real real life universe of the essay um, and as part of this discussion the members of this murder club go all the way back to Cain and Abel as one of citing it as one of the the earliest noteworthy murders to take place in the history of the world and and they build on this discussion further and further to discuss murders that we will recognize or historically we can we can root rather as something recognizable because it took place in in public um and and in the real world landscape alongside ones that are slightly more fictional um or inspired by real life rather than pulling from them directly and alongside this um this discussion that takes place as part of de quincey's murder club there is also this wider discussion taking place of Kantian philosophy, um, which is kind of adds to the absurdity of it, but at the same time weights his discussion with uh, sort of a real authenticity and credibility that you perhaps wouldn't expect on the opening of it. Um, but as a, as a means to show just how sort of fascinated people were becoming with murder at the, at the time sort of pre-Jack pre the Ripper and, and into the early 1900s, this is sort of really quite a crowning discussion on, um, on what that looked like. Um, so in terms of 
sort of a further evolution of this then. So with societal progression, there was naturally change um, and murder or true crime in a broader sense uh, kind of moved with that change, but certainly never shifted out of fashion. Um, that said, there have been changes in how it was documented and how it was appreciated. Um, so Lucy Worsley, who I mentioned earlier, is one of the kind of the, the crowning critics of sort of murder reportage in this area, in this era rather, comments, the most infamous crimes were honoured with the publication of books consisting of more than one broadsheet folded together. The printers discovered that they could sell books about old murders too. At the time the new one occurred, it seems that once people were in a murder mood, they wanted as much of it as they could get. Um, so Worsley pins down the precise time period that saw this shift from broadside reportage through to some of these earliest true crime books, um, albeit they're, they're vastly different from the mammoth 700 page manuscripts that we might find nowadays. Um, and within this discussion, she also cites the likes of Charles Dickens as being sort of a, a contributing writer to this sort of movement, given that he not only produced great works of fiction at the time, but he also borrowed heavily from real life stimuli in order to do so. So, so even with the likes of Dickens, we can find this early demonstration of how fact and fiction become, become blended and become quite seamless. Um, in ways that we can we can also observe in true crime in sorry we can also observe in contemporary crime writing alongside true crime writing as we'll come to discuss in a little more detail later. Um, and Worsley also comments this pleasure in violence is timeless. It just takes different forms and emphases depending on the technologies and economy of an age. Um, and this is particularly. Um, important, particularly significant, given some of the media formats that we're going to think about later, where true crime reportage has kind of gone above and beyond um, just print media and extended into things like YouTube videos, podcast productions and, and, other, and other similar outlets. Um, now, Alice Berlin um, has done a lot of work in this area and has discussed um, kind of high and low brow true, true crime as it exists now. Um, so she has a, an article available online titled The Ethical Dilemma of High Row True Crime. And in this, she proposes a, a clear distinction between the two things um, and, and how they are um, explored and in many ways exploited across different media platforms. And she also talks as well about the, the inherent dangers of each type of work, particularly given highbrow true crime that is produced with this apparent or alleged authenticity. There's a, there's a clear author, authoritarian feel to it that really encourages audiences to actually buy into what it is that they're being told, which is, which is as far as Berlin is concerned, sort of where the danger in lies. So for, for these so-called prestige true crime, true crime offerings, the question of ethics, of the potential to interfere in real criminal cases and real people's lives is even more important precisely because they are taken seriously. And, and with this note on the potential to interfere in real criminal cases, there is a, there is a wealth of research um, and a wealth of documentation available now to show how true crime and the way in which it selectively portrays certain information can, can really have potential to have kind of a knock-on detrimental effect on cases that are ongoing. Um, and in some instances, even cases that have already closed, there have been sort of petitions started for various um, various criminal cases that are kind of long long in the in the public in the public memory that have been reopened for one reason or another because some documentary or another has found open quote new evidence close quote um, that can that can change I don't know how someone was prosecuted or how someone wasn't prosecuted as the case may be. Um, so there is a lot of evidence kind of in, in support of the comments that Berlin makes in this paper. Um, so it feels important. Um, anyone who knows me personally knows that this is the this is the time at which 
stuff gets um, stuff gets loud in my research background when it comes to talking about Truman Capote. Nevertheless, it feels opportune to introduce Truman Capote at this point, um, given that he is uh, one of the authors who, who hugely contributed to this early distinction of low and highbrow true crime writing. Um, with his seminal work in Cold Blood. Um, and in this, Capote, Capote tried um, to make true crime into something literary rather than kind of the, the throwaway literature it had been considered as for, for some years prior to this. Part of the reason for that being is that it sort of started to make appearances in things like Penny Dreadful magazines, for example, um, and it wasn't it wasn't hailed as having the same sort of literary status as as other genres of works were. But Capote set about set about changing that. Um, he truly believed that he had sort of coined a new way of writing um, in this non-fiction novel that brought with it flavours of new journalism and and in sort of bringing that to the forefront people started to take what he'd done and what others could do more seriously than they had done previously. Um, in Paul Levine's paper on the matter reality and fiction he actually directs directly quotes Capote as having expressed a desire to create an open quote hybrid form close quote of writing um, which is obviously no problem in isolation of itself um, the the problem came around later um, when Capote asserted that he would write a open quote really big serious work it would be precisely like a novel with a single difference every word of it would be true from beginning to end. I called this, in my mind, a non-fiction novel. So in his own assessment of the work, Levine then goes on to comment that with consummate re repertorial skill and a novelist's eye for shape and detail, Capote traces the course of events from the day the Clutter family is butchered to the night some six years later when the killers are hanged. An artistic job of reporting in depth in cold blood is certainly first rate. As the progenitor of a new species of novel, its credentials are somewhat more dubious. Um, and off the back of that particular, um, particular quote, it may be worth turning our attentions as to, as to why it's slightly more dubious in that sense. Um, so it is noteworthy that in many ways Capote, Capote did indeed sort of start changing the face of true crime and give people another way of observing this genre um, and it really did sort of bolster the reputation of the genre in that sense as well. Um, the problem with In Cold Blood is that it also cast a lot of doubt around literary true crime because there are contents of the book that have since been widely questioned. Um, one of the most sort of damning examples of this and one of the ones to be most cited um, is actually around Perry Smith's last minute remorse ahead of being executed. Um, Perry Smith being one of two murderers um, who was found who was found guilty of having been involved in the Clutters family death. Um, and in In Cold Blood, uh, Capote documents that after the warden asked if he had anything to say, his expression was sober. His sensitive eyes gazed gravely at the surrounding faces, swerved up to the shadowy hangman, then downwards to his own manacled hands. I think, he said, it's a hell of a thing to take a life in this manner. I don't believe in capital punishment, morally or legally. Maybe I had something to contribute. Sorry, maybe I had something to contribute, something. His assurance faltered, shyness blurred his voice, lowered it to just audible level. It would be meaningless to apologize for what I did, even inappropriate, but I do, I apologize. Um, now, the reason that I that I pulled this out then is because um, since In Cold Blood was published, there have actually been people or other people who were at um, Perry Smith's execution who flat out deny that this ever happened. And, and alongside the, the denial of it, 
um, one of the detectives involved in the case not only went on record to say, no, that did not happen. He also went on record to say, even had, even had it happened, Truman Capote actually wasn't standing within earshot of Perry Smith during the execution setup. So even if Perry Smith had expressed remorse, there's no way that Capote could have heard it. Um, and in addition to this kind of inciting incident regarding Perry's late in the day apology, there were also other entire conversations that participants have since claimed never happened, um, alongside quite a few incidents as well that Capote simply cannot know to write with such accuracy on account of firstly having not been present in the moment that the incident took place, and secondly, not having research opportunity to authenticate his retelling of events. Um, so there are certainly ways in which he narrates the killer's time together, for example, when they were both on the run, where he, he narrates this with a novelist's eye, um, which is all well and good, but then we begin to sidestep his earlier claim that everything in the book is, is, a, is a true word, because those two things can't, just simply can't coexist. Um, there's also overwhelming evidence throughout the text to show his blatant bias in favour of Perry Smith, um, who some critics have said actually comes to be characterised as though he is one of Capote's own fictional cre creations, um, it's kind of measuring up quite evenly with some of the leading men in Capote's other novels. Um, and this contrasts greatly with how... Um, Dick Hickok, who is the other accused murderer or the other convicted murderer, um, is, is presented by Capote as well. In fact, um, Capote goes to great lengths to describe Hickok in very exaggerated villainous terms. So one of the more standout examples of this uh, in, the, in the text is, it was as though his head had been halved like an apple, then put together a fraction off centre an accident that left his long-jawed and narrow face tilted, the left side rather lower than the right, with the results that the lips were slightly aslant, the nose askew, and his eyes not situated at uneven levels, but of uneven size, the left one being truly serpentine with a venomous, sickly blue squint. And this is sort of markedly different from the ways in which Perry is described throughout, who is, for example, described as being pitifully scarred by things that have damaged him. And he is often written as having these kind of dazzling blue eyes that someone might get lost in, which perhaps explains Capote's bias, um, but, but nevertheless certainly underscores this, I suppose, inability for objectivity that, that Capote seems to latch on to very early on in um, very early on in the in cold blood production. Um, significantly again then there's been sort of extensive work done not only on in cold blood and representations of fact and fiction as part of in cold blood um, but also the ways in which the book evolved. Um, so Jack de Bailis did um, a really interesting comparative linguistic analysis um, between the In Cold Blood as it was originally published in the New Yorker. Um, so it first came out as a serialization before it was um, compiled together and, and put in its better known manuscript form for the Random House edition um, that we've all come to know and tolerate. Um, and and in, his, um, in his analysis of this, de Bellis found that from one version to the next, Capote ne made nearly 5,000 changes ranging from crucial matters of fact to the placement of a comma. Um, and when de Bellis talks about crucial matters of fact, he, he, means, um, he means things like direct quotations from people. Um, so I have a, a small, small extract um, that I will just leave to hover for a second there. Now we can see from this that 
this, this particular extract, De Bernays does include um, a few of these throughout to, to kind of put everything in accessible table form. Again, this is a really interesting journal article that I highly recommend having a read of. Um, but in this particular table form, we are being asked to focus specifically on changes to quoted material, um, which is obviously problematic because something somewhere has gone wrong if changes are being made to quoted material. Now, we either can't trust the New Yorker version or we can't trust the final version as it was published by Random House because Capote has no authority over this information if indeed it is quoted material. And even things like punctuation having been changed, the placement of a, the placement of a comma may seem, may seem miscellaneous in itself, may seem insignificant um, in terms of what it can do for our reading of a text. But actually when you're talking about things like killers relaying their final days on the road with each other, the ways in which that information is delivered through quoted material and through things like punctuation actually becomes very important to a reader's perception of, of that killer and, and how they communicate themselves. So, so for Capote to, to go in and amend that information really runs counter to the quote that we considered at the beginning of this, wherein Capote claimed everything in the book was gonna be absolute truth which was clearly not the case one way or another. Um, now I realize that I am in many ways coming down hard on the side of true crime already, or not on the side of it rather, but I suppose a, a, opposing it as a true genre. Um, but, it's a, it's a very significant but, um, there are authors who are trying to buck this trend of being a little fast and loose with the truth when it comes to true crime productions. Um, so to walk you through these examples then, so Helter Skelter um, is the Charles Manson story or the, the Charles Manson family story. Um, and it was written um, primarily by Vincent Bugliosi, who was actually the prosecutor of the case. Um, it is, I will warn you now, a house brick of a book, certainly one worth getting on Kindle rather than getting in paperback if you are considering delving into it. Um, but but having read it, I can attest to the fact that the work is written in a notably detached reportage style. And, and in that sense, it makes sense as non-fiction. It makes sense as something that is authentically true crime. There are endless footnotes throughout where Bugliosi cites conversations, references, interviews, readers, should they feel so inclined, would be able to substantiate the claims that are made in Helter Skelter. And, and again, if they felt so inclined, they would be able to kind of trace the lineage of conversations or witness reports or any anything else in regards to supporting information um, for things that have been things that have been reproduced in the book. Um, alongside this, um, I've chosen to spotlight two Maggie Nelson publications, um, partly because both of them experiment with the true crime form insofar as its written structure. Um, and I think that they do very interesting things in that respect, insofar as how, how true crime information can be presented. Um, so throughout both of these works, Nelson uses um, uses uh, kind of a conventional narrative structure, but she also uses poetry, she uses erasure, she uses epistolary entries. Um, she, she is endeavouring to relay the tale of her aunt's murder um, and the way in which that, that incident, that loss became essentially sort of a, a spectre to her family in many ways. Um, significantly in both of these examples then the author and both of these examples by that I mean in Nelson's examples and in Bugliosi's example um, the authors are writing from inside as it were so their proximity to the case or to the cases is markedly different to that of someone like Truman Capote who actually act, actually came to this case as kind of a latecomer 
thanks to a nudge by Harper Lee, incidentally. Um, but he came to the case as a latecomer and he was very much on the outskirts. He remained very much on the outskirts. He could not, he could not integrate himself into the goings on of that town as things were unfolding in the first days of the Clutter's murder. Um, meanwhile, the likes of Bugliosi and Nelson are obviously writing from a very informed perspective because they are attesting to their own lived experiences. And I think that this is this is perhaps a, a noteworthy thing to consider when it comes to true crime authorship and the ways in which we we do and don't or can and can't rather trust the truth element of um, of the genre and what it can do for us. Um, now, sort of building on some of these discussions um, and building on some of the more moral elements that are going to come into play as part as part of the true crime genre. Um, I've already mentioned this idea of the proximity to the case and indeed the way in which this can sort of act as an influence over how a case is relayed. Um, you would know, for example, in Helter Skelter, that kind of detached reported reported tone that you get. Bugliosi is very much giving you something from a legal standpoint here, which of course is the way in which he communicates himself on a daily basis because it's his profession, it's the way in which he engaged with the case. And likewise, Nelson uses her own creative license, but but she has she has authority to do that because she she is part of the story. Um, author bias and authorial intentions very much worthy of consideration when it comes to moral ambiguities that can kind of come out of these seminal works that we've already considered then i've i've mentioned the ways in which capote leaned in favor of one of the killers bizarrely enough um, it's unclear what his intentions were in doing that. It's unclear whether he was aware that he was doing that, but there was certainly an author bias in the way that that was communicated. And because of that, this moral ambiguity comes about again in terms of what we can and can't trust of the publication. Accuracy of reportage and level of reportage are very much two things that go hand in hand, sort of now, now more so than ever. Um, and when I reference um, the level of reportage, what I mean here is, is kind of the level of research essentially and what information from that research eventually does and doesn't go into the production of a final text. Um, Netflix's Making a Murderer is, is iconic um, as, a, as a contemporary example of, of this sort of level of reportage grey area. Um, insofar as the ways in which information, once it's been discovered, is then left out. Um, and, and the producers of the show were very much criticised for having left out information in order to skew the depiction of the, of the case. And, and that was something that was called into question very publicly because it was one of these instances where a, a production like Making a Murderer really had an impact on the the real life criminal proceedings of an incident as it unfolded um so certainly something worth considering when it comes to the information that we receive and subsequently the information that we can trust off the back of that um employment of creative techniques and telling um is a, a final moral ambiguity or area of moral ambiguities that I think um, is worth considering alongside this discussion of true crime. Um, part of the reason for this being here is that, of course, Maggie Nelson utilises creative technique, poetic technique throughout her work. Um, there are times in which she even uses um, journal entries from her, from her aunt's found journals, um, and she sort of, she, she uses erasure um, for these extracts in a way that tries, tries to recapture the voice of her arm effectively. Um, and this is obviously a very, a very creative way of telling a reader something about a victim. But again, it kind of swings us back to this proximity of the case issue in that, in that Nelson is close enough in, to the case that she, she kind of has authority to be doing something like that. Um, meanwhile, Again, I'm going to make an example of Capote. Meanwhile, um, 
creative techniques insofar as I'm going to change this conversation because it makes for better reading is morally ambiguous to say the least. Um, disingenuous is, is probably a better word to use for it. Um, and, I, and I hold Capote up as an example at every available opportunity in life. Um, but I hold Capote up as, as an example in, in this when truthfully, he is far from being the only author who does who does that sort of thing, or specifically the only true crime author who does that sort of thing, um, because there are occasions where authors will take creative license and say, do you know what, actually this conversation reads better if X, Y, and Z things have happened, rather than, rather than if I tell it as it originally was. Um, yes morally ambiguous but certainly something that is happening more and more in true crime um written texts alongside um, alongside other medias as well um now of course turning out attention to some of those other medias um true crime is no longer singularly represented in written works um and and as a result of that true crime representations no longer or, and the problems that they that they entail don't exist in a singular vacuum either um, so there are now numerous subgenres um, that have to be considered when it comes to not only authenticity of the of the of the true crime genre at large but also what its conventions are and and what it's doing with the truth um, and I use that with considerable air quotes around it um, so we've already we've already name dropped Netflix is making a murderer, which obviously alludes to this sort of film television streaming services um, in so far as true crime releases. But we also have podcasts, both singular episodes and entire serializations. Um, it was kind of 2015 ish, if memory serves right, that, that really true crime pod podcast really start, started to gain steam. Um, and Serial has been cited as, as kind of the, the podcast production that really changed, changed everything for how true crime was, was utilised in that, in that particular media format. Um, it has also, although it, it blows my small mind quite considerably, um, now shifted over into the realm of makeup tutorials. Um, and because I was slightly nervous that people wouldn't take me seriously if I included if I included that in that list I actually have um, an, a slight extract from one of them I'm hoping that this will take us right to the clip where the um, the host of this starts laughing bathroom just kind of swinging over the bathtub was Bill's chest and torso with the arms and like legs removed from it just hanging there mm -hmm. police found that it had been skinned carved and was left bleeding into the tub like the same way you would do in a butcher shop i guess i don't know i've never but you know <laughs> i'm not laughing at i'm just laughing because like i'm assuming based off movies i've seen of like butchers they hang the meat and stuff Anyways, so it's like that. Yeah, great. And when the butchers are trying to dry out the dead animal, they have to let like all the blood run out. It was that, but a human body. So when police... Um, I will pause it there rather than let that drag on for too long. Um, so my understanding is that um, murder, mystery and makeup actually has quite a cult following at this point. Um, I've listened to the podcast version of this um, where the host comes off in 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 much the same manner um obviously without the um without the visual accompaniment of the of the makeup itself having been done but the entire premise of this youtube channel is that the host um narrates and critiques incidents of true crime whilst whilst putting on makeup or whilst doing a makeup tutorial um, and I, I desperately want to come at this from a critical perspective, but I'm, I have to confess, I don't think I'm quite ready to. Um, but my, my reason for pulling up this, this particular um, part of this video is that this sort of accidental humour that comes about in true crime reportage, for want of a better word, um, is is something that's happening more and more in the in the ways in which um, true crime is delivered, um, particularly in podcasts. There is quite a crossover between true crime and comedy now, and 
while I'm, I, I, I don't mean to uh, disregard the efforts of the producers and the hosts of these podcasts. I've, I listen to a lot of them. I find them morbidly enjoyable. Um, they they have kind of had to defend themselves quite often in in the last few months, particularly about why it is a natural pairing for true crime to go so so easily hand in hand with things like nervous laughter and sarcastic commentary and all of those sorts of things. Police got a closer look. They oh, skip ahead lest we get too drawn into that particular case. Um, something that is worth considering then, um, I suppose, in defense of true crime um, is, is whether it is for entertainment or whether it is for educational value. Um, now, as a, as a background to this, um, I did some reading on Kevin Balfe, who is CrimeCon's founder and executive producer. CrimeCon being exactly what it sounds like, but for anyone who's in any doubt, it is a, it is a true crime convention of sorts. Um, and he, on the topic of why true crime is so celebrated, commented the interest is that most of these stories represent what all great stories have there's a hero there's a villain there's usually a mystery there's oftentimes a traumatic event there's usually a resolution um so here then commodification becomes less about educational merit and more about entertainment because people are just attracted to these narratives and the ways in which these narratives spin out despite the fact, despite the often overlooked fact, that at, at their cause, these, these aren't fictional narratives, they are factual narratives, and they essentially belong to other people, i.e. i.e. the victims of the crime. Um, and, and in some cases, these victims are living, in some cases, these victims have passed away, but, but whatever the case, the, these crimes shouldn't really be in public domain for people to write about however however they choose to and kind of in in support of that um in a really interesting article again one that's available online um a foreman in untangling true crime um explores like the real knock-on impact that uh, entertainment led productions have on victims rather than do you know any sort of educational led productions may have um and he quotes a particular victim as having said what happened to me is not a story it's my life and this same victim cautions companies intent on telling crime stories without the permission of people who actually lived them should be held to account if not by laws, then by the court of public opinion. Um, and the, the reason that this quote seems, you know, quite so pertinent to this discussion is that actually, in I would say in the last 10 years or so, there have been numerous famous cases of victims of crimes, of victims of families that have been involved in crimes, actually asking production companies not to report on a certain case, and the production companies have done it anyway. Um, that applies to both television, film, streaming, ser streaming services in particular, actually Netflix has, Netflix has had this particular situation play out for them multiple times, um, particularly given that true crime is kind of their, their best watched genre um, on the streaming service at this point. Um, but they, they persist in making these productions, in sharing these productions, even though, even though quietly there are petitions going on for, for it not to be done or even if it is done for certain information not to be shared um, and, and they don't seem to take heed in that. Um, stretching our minds back ever so slightly um, to consider it, it, some, some truth reported um, or not as the case may be. Um, so Fargo was or is rather a 1996 production that followed the character of Jerry, who is a, a down on his luck car salesman. Um, he hires two criminals to abduct his wife. Uh, and the underlying hope in that is that um, it will 
give him the opportunity to extort money from his wealthy father-in-law um, because Jerry finds himself in a spot of bother. Um, things don't quite unfold in that manner. The film eventually spirals into being as much a black comedy as it is a crime narrative. Um, but my reason for wanting to draw attention to this is that the film opens with, this is a true story. The events depicted in this film took place in Minnesota in 1987. At the request of the survivors, the names have been changed out of respect for the dead. The rest has been told exactly as it occurred, which is quite a weighty sentiment to open any production with. The problematic element of it is that in a in a much later interview in two uh, in 2016, sorry, Ethan Cohen, who is one of the co-writers of Fargo, commented, "We wanted to make a movie just in the genre of a true story movie. You don't have to have a true story to make a true story movie." Now, this is my emphasis here. Um, because I thought that this particular quote was a very telling one in so far as whether whether the truth of something has become an idealized genre um, and whether whether such a whether such a claim can be made for for the truth as it exists in media productions. Of course, the implication here is that true stories open quote close quote are a fictionalized genre of works. And that because they are a fictionalized genre or a fictional genre rather, they they can true stories can essentially be fabricated and reimagined. The problem with that being is that when crime narratives are absorbed into this genre of true story narratives, we lose boundaries and distinctions entirely. Sorry, I've got a no noisy puppy in the background. Um, we we know we we lose the boundary or the distinction of the real and the imagined, um, and and there are no ambiguities at, at, at the heart of that. It's 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 just how it works out when when these sorts of narratives collapse into each other, um, which is certainly something to consider. Um, kind of in our day-to-day -day consumption of, of true crime writing. Um, something I think worth integrating into this discussion then is, is this idea of a post-truth era being something that's on the horizon now. Um, now, Cambridge Dictionary defines post-truth as relating to a situation in which people are more likely to accept an argument based on their emotions and beliefs rather than one based on facts, um, which is particularly telling um, and particularly pertinent to any discussions of true crime. Um, it is a, a term often associated with political narratives, but of course in this context as well, it seems particularly relevant because there are, there are many sort of post-truth principles in practice when it comes to, when it comes to true crime readership, authorship, everything in between. Again, this isn't a problem necessarily, but what is problematic is when it's considered alongside the name of the genre, which posits truth as being somehow fundamental to the ways in which these narratives are delivered to us. Um, because we are, we're not necessarily getting true narratives, we're getting post-truth narratives, um, which is potentially a very different thing. Um, something else worth drawing attention here to as well, I think at least certainly, is this, this idea of post-truth as something that we come to associate with political narratives. Um, now there is more than a little something of the political and true crime writing as well, and of course at, at the me at media productions at large, or in media productions at large, sorry, um, but the, the questionability over what is truth and what is not is something that is long standing and long interrogated in true crime works already, particularly when we consider things like sexual assault and abuse cases, where, where the singular truth becomes very grayscale according to the narratives that are involved or according to the competing narratives that involve. 
there, there is much more to be said on this. It is an entire lecture in itself. Um, but insofar as this sort of interconnectivity between the post-truth era, true crime and the political, there is certainly something larger to unfold there. Um, in so far as narrative tellings, we've kind of we've, or narrative conventions, we've already alluded to this idea of of high and low brow true crime, um, which is something that critics are becoming more and more aware of as we go along. Um, it has true crime being it, it has its own set of conventions, whether it is visual media or whether it is written. Um, visual media media being particularly recognisable for audiences now, so lowbrow true crime can be often determined by lighting, camera work, even the use of specific soundtracks or sound effects. There is usually quite a dramatic flair to the telling of these um, to the telling of these stories as they are depicted in in lowbrow productions or so-called lowbrow productions. Meanwhile, things like highbrow true crime often relies very much on single person framework. Um, this being sort of the head in the box phenomenon where, where we are often having a close up um, with a so-called expert witness or someone who's associated, associated with the case. They often dominate screen time quite considerably, which means that their narrative is, is, is really foregrounded here as being sort of like an essential perspective when it comes to retelling whatever the story is or retelling the, the, the central facets of the story. Um, it is this style of production somewhat significant, significantly that kind of brings in that authenticity and, and that authoritarian feel that we that we mentioned earlier in relation to the Alice Berlin article. Um, and, and because of that, it, legit, it legitimizes the work and we feel that there is an accuracy here that, that makes it easier for us to trust. And, and suddenly we forget about, we forget about the, the phenomena of what might the real truth be and what might the, the multifaceted truth be. And again, we're kind of leaning more into this sort of post-truth reading of, of a true crime text, wherein we believe whatever it is that we're being told at face value because it seems believable, um, which, many people can be forgiven for, but surely there is something more to interrogate alongside that as well. Um, now, if we crack this open slightly further and consider some of, some of the problems that exist within true crime, um, there are many, um, I'm sure that we would need another lecture on top of this one, um, but, but perhaps some of the, some of the more political issues that exist within true crime. Um, so the common attitudes of disrespect to those involved in the real life narratives. Um, so this, this kind of hails back to some of the points that I was making earlier in so far as victims and how things are represented or misrepresented um, and, and how things are ignored when they kind of make a plea for certain things to be left out. Um, I feel like I'm suddenly throwing Netflix under the bus here, but their, their iconic Tiger King series is exemplar for this opening point. Um, and for a series that has prompted a string of parody songs sampling from the songs that are featured on the show, it also has endless memes that are now in circulation as well but one of the more significant examples of this that that I think very much applies to this point is that within minutes of the death of one of the one of the characters or one of the individuals on the show um character seems a, a fast and loose term to use in in this context but within minutes of this character's um, husband's death being announced, there was already a meme about his death. Um, it was developed, it was distributed online, it took, it took less time to, to make and publicise than it did for the episode itself to air. And, and that, that kind of disrespect fostered as part of this genre is, is hugely problematic, but, but also you know kind of very representative of the kind of disrespect that's become associated with true crime production or not true crime productions necessarily but true crime victims I suppose 
Um, the dissemination of misinformation um, is also a problem, which is something that we've considered quite a lot here, particularly in regards to early publications in the genre. Um, again, Netflix is making a murderer des deserves to kind of be underscored here. It was flooded with conflicting testimonies alongside misinformation and cover ups that brought into question the integrity of those behind the show. And it really encouraged a lot of people to question their motives in so far as why are they why are they even making this show? What's their end game? What do they what do they hope to achieve or what do they hope to what do they hope to encourage other people towards or encourage their viewers towards um and one of one of the things that i don't think is discussed enough in relation to true crime is the fact that it has a racist and classist underbelly and um, and i realize that that is a bold statement but it's a it's a hill that i will make myself comfortable on um there are many marginalized groups that go underrepresented, even though they are often the ones most commonly falling victim to violent crime, violent crime specifically. Um, Tiger King, again, is a is a fine example of this classist issue as it takes place in true crime production, wherein characters from from kind of a lower social standing are often mocked. They're often made into hyperbole for the purpose of entertainment. Though, of course, this isn't singular entertainment either, but something that can be sort of recycled and rehashed into many different forms and disseminated across the Internet all over again for continued entertainment. So the memes, the parody songs, the satirical publications and all of those all of those things that stem specifically from classist representations in this one show. But alongside that, the underrepresentation of people of colour, queer people and disabled people is also evident throughout true crime documentation despite the prevalence of crime that is faced by these minorities so so true crime as a genre then across all mediums remains kind of a haven for the missing white woman syndrome and this is something that you will come up uh, come up against a lot in true crime research in representations of true crime um it's a it's a common phrase that sort of critiques the fact that if you have a missing white woman who is typically cishet and middle class you will draw more attention from viewing and reading masses than if you were to spotlight any other social class or gender and we can talk about it until the cows come home and then no doubt talk to the cows about it but it but it is very much a reality um, as it is seen in true in true crime work and that that isn't just in written productions it very much isn't just in in visual productions either it's in in all of these kind of small pockets of true crime that exist in the middle of the two in terms of how we overcome these issues then um, so Rachel, Ch Rachel Chestnut, sorry, in an essay that was published by the New York Times, encourages viewers to remain conscious of what they consume and never accept subjective interpretations as indisputable fact. Now, the very fact that there have been more adaptations of the Ted Bundy story alone than there have been collectively for Steve Jobs, David Bowie and Ruth Bader Ginsburg speaks speaks volumes, um, not only in terms of the problem that, that we are developing or fast developing with true crime, but, but also for this increased need of awareness around what it is that we're consuming. So, of course, these productions are made for entertainment value and we are we are surely allowed to find them entertaining as a result of that. But educating ourselves in relation to cases, learning to tell the difference between informed reportage and ill informed reportage and kind of refusing to blanket watch all true crime productions as they are represented to us will ultimately kind of build us a better resistance to these things. So. Even, even though being a conscientious audience member does perhaps not seem like the easiest and most relaxing way to enjoy, enjoy a true crime production, it is a way of ensuring that you can authenticate whatever it is that you're consuming about any given case or any given stream of cases. Um, sorry, I've got, got so enwrapped talking to the screen that I've entirely lost my place with my notes. Um, 
another thing that we want to consider alongside that, whether it is viewing or listening or reading, is also the involvement of the victims. Um, and so by that, I'm referring to the fact that many of the works that we've mentioned already are noteworthy for more than just their inaccuracies. Alongside that, their blatant disrespect for the victims, living victims specifically at their cause, who have made multiple pleas against the sharing of materials and the peddling of certain narratives, which different authors, directors and producers have all ignored in favour of producing a work as it was originally intended, rather than reaching any sort of compromise. And this is another area that kind of requires a greater amount of awareness and will encourage more conscientious consumption from us all, because presumably if we are watching something wherein living victims have authenticated material, they have given the production their, their blessing for want of a better expression, they have even been involved in it to, to some degree, um, even if it's to a small degree, we, we can start to perhaps believe that this production, at least in isolation, is moving away from hyperbole and moving away from just rehashing things as we already know them and instead moving towards something that actually contributes to, to a more accurate true crime canon, which uh, I, I think is what is what we should be working towards, whether it's in the realm of podcasting or, or written materials or anything that exists between, between those two goalposts. Um, it is worth kind of flagging up the fact that there are lots of true crime narratives now that are being told exhaustively and and you know this this Ted Bundy reality as it exists above uh, as it exists above that point it goes goes to show that there are lots of things now that are being repeddled for the sake of uh, for the sake of new evidence open quote close quote um, or new expert testimony um, again with uh, considerable quote marks around it um, when the reality of it is is that it, it's not new at all it may just be that we're close to an anniversary or it may just be that that particular producer decided that it was their time to contribute to the Ted Bundy canon um, so so all of these things are, are kind of worth remaining aware of when it comes to our, our consumption of the genre um, an extensive re reference list um, for, for just someone talking at you for an hour. Um, I'm not sure where I stand on making this claim, so it may be something that I have to retract further down the line. I'm more than happy to share this reference list um, with the kind organisers of this lecture um, if it's something that people would would appreciate having distributed to them. Um, so it's something that you can you can perhaps go and have a nosy at yourselves. There are some really, really interesting texts here um, for anyone who, who might like to, to do further research into the matter. Um, but beyond that, thank you very much for your time. And I welcome any questions anyone might have. Now I've finished talk, talking at you solid for an hour. <laughs> Thank you very much, Charlie. I know I know you talked for an hour, but it was superb, really thought provoking, and very, very powerful. Um, and I think all of us obviously need to take on the, I think the impact on victims as, as you uh, drew out there and the dis disrespect shown, I think to them is, is obviously quite distressing really, isn't it? It made me think of the, the programs that um, around Princess Diana's um, anniversary, the programmes yeah. that sort of appeared with new evidence and new theories yeah. and you know even though she, obviously she's not around anymore you know her sons are watching or seeing that and it must just be awful for them and that's just one example. Yeah, yeah very much so. Yeah thank you very much. Um, from Polly Stratton, an interesting lecture, thank you Charlie, I was intrigued by the post-truth part um, so just a comment there from, from her. So thank you very much, Polly, for, you, Polly, for that. We've got another comment from Ben Humphrey saying it's been fascinating. Thank you so much. I've got so many things I want to unpack that need to digest first. So um, I think probably um, a lot of people are feeling like that. There was just so much information and it was so powerful. Uh, so thank you very much, Ben, for that comment. 
and May says, thank, thank you, much to think about. I really enjoyed your lecture. I will reassess how I view and consume true crime in the media in future and help to also give my students food for thought as well. Uh, I'm very happy to hear that, May. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and I think we probably all, all feel like that, really. Um, and Rachel says, thanks for an interesting talk. I came along because my research is on using real crimes to inspire fiction, something that can be equally exploitative. Yeah, oh, that's really interesting. Um, thank you for coming, Rachel. Thank you ever so much for that. It was so thought provoking. Oh, thank you um, for having me. And a great way to spend um, uh, a Wednesday evening. So uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you to everyone who came. Mm, sorry, sorry if I ruined Netflix. <laughs> gosh, not at all. Not at all. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to all of this, those who have um, joined us tonight. Um, and hopefully we might see you on Wednesday the 28th. And Rachel just says thank you both um, and goodbye. So um, on that note, we'll say goodbye and thank you very much to everybody. Thanks everyone. Thank you, bye-bye.